Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. There's a black hole lurking within a thousand light years of Earth, and people in the southern hemisphere can see stars circling it with the naked eye. Two terabytes of Nintendo source code was leaked. Facebook trained their AI chatbot using Reddit posts. Tesla has applied to become an electricity supplier in the UK. The Poco F2 Pro smartphone with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 has launched globally. And Twitter will allow employees to work from home for as long as they want. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Astronomers have stumbled across the nearest black hole to us yet. The void lies at the heart of a stellar system just a thousand light years away, and indications to its location are visible to the naked eye. A team of researchers were observing the HR 6819 star system from the European Southern Observatory in Chile as part of a wider survey studying binary star systems, and they stumbled across a third object. Spectrographic data revealed that one of the stars orbited an invisible companion every 40 days. Meanwhile, the second star sits much farther away from the first. They now believe that the HR 6819 is not a double system, but a triple system, one that contains two stars that are both around the six solar masses, and a third object that is at least 4.2 solar masses. That number is much too high for the object to be a neutron star. Thomas Ravinius, first author of the study, said, An invisible object with a mass at least four times that of the Sun can only be a black hole. If the researchers are indeed correct, the object will be the closest black hole from Earth discovered yet. Peter Hadrava, the co-author of the research, said the team was totally surprised when we realized that this is the first stellar system with a black hole that can be seen with the unaided eye. As a point of clarity, the black hole itself isn't visible to the naked eye, only the stars are. For those in the Southern Hemisphere hoping to catch a glimpse, it's located in the Telescopium constellation and will be best viewed during a clear night, and two fuzzy bright pinpricks should be discernible without binoculars or a telescope. Although the object seems to have been near us all along, it has escaped detection until now. Not only is the black hole pretty small, it's also very quiet, meaning it doesn't spew jets of electromagnetic radiation, unlike the supermassive ones at the centers of galaxies guzzling up the stars. The team has only managed to infer its existence from the wobble of the stars that orbit it. The team is hoping to capture images of the orbit to further establish the distance and mass of the system's objects. An anonymous hacker leaked around two terabytes worth of source code related to the Nintendo Wii, GameCube, and Nintendo 64 designs. This cache includes Verilog code for the hardware, essentially the coded blueprints for the various chips. While a neat peek into the inner workings of Nintendo and a rare look at the low-level design of the specialized chips that go into consoles, don't expect too much to come out of this. While in theory the Verilog code could be used to turn clo chips into Nintendo chip knockoffs, the equipment and expertise needed to do that would be very expensive and not the sort of thing a hobbyist could do and any commercial efforts would no doubt be torn to shreds by Nintendo lawyers. The leak also, apparently, won't be of any use to the developers of emulators who can only legally do what they do by reverse engineering. The developers of the Dolphin emulator say in response to the leak, we cannot use anything of any sort from a leak. In fact, we can't even look at it. Dolphin is only legal because we are clean room reverse engineering the GameCube and Wii. If we use anything from a leak, Dolphin is no longer legal, and Nintendo will shut us down. That's not to say there won't be a fly-by-night emulators uh, which include the leaked code, but we'd advise serious caution when considering uh, using any such tool, as it is very likely to include malware or backdoors for malicious use. Facebook has launched a new chatbot that it claims is able to demonstrate empathy, knowledge, and personality. Their chatbot, which they've annoyingly named Blender, was trained using available public domain conversations, which included 1.5 billion examples of human exchanges. But experts say training the artificial intelligence using a platform such as Reddit has its drawbacks. 
Numerous issues arose during longer conversations. Blender would sometimes respond with offensive language, and at other times it would make up facts altogether. Researchers said they hoped further models would address some of these issues. Artificial intelligence expert Dave Choppin said that Blender was a step in the right direction, but noted two fundamental issues that still need to be overcome. He told the BBC, the first is just how complex it is to replicate all of the nuances of a human attribute, like the ability to hold a a conversation, a a skill that most three-year-olds can master. The second is around the relationship with the data used to train the model and the results generated by the model. He goes on to explain, as great a platform as Reddit is, training algorithms based on the conversations you find there is going to get you a lot of chaff amongst the wheat. Facebook also compared Blender's performance with the latest version of Google's own chatbot, Mina. It showed people two sets of conversations, one made with Blender and the other with Mina. Conversations included a wide range of topics, including movies, music, and veganism. Facebook said the 67% of respondents through Blender sounded more human than Mina. The researchers noted, We achieved this milestone through a new chatbot recipe that includes improved decoding techniques, novel blending of skills, and a model with 9.4 billion parameters, which is 3.6 times more than the largest existing system. Building a truly intelligent dialogue agent that can chat like a human remains one of the largest open challenges in AI today. All right. Thanks, Becca. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, Robert Koenig is here with the Crypto Corner, and Becca's got more news stories for us coming up as well. Stick around. back to the crypto corner. I hope you're well. Uh, this week I'd like to focus on information. <clears throat> if you've been more than one week with this in, in this industry uh, and you've browsed around YouTube or any other news outlets, you'll have seen that there is a lot of different information out there and most of that is misleading. Yeah, You've got those maximalists that are uh, pretending that their coin or token is the best one and that everything else is pretty bad. You have got uh, those that are shilling coins or that are trying to sell you something. And a lot of people also have got no clue what they're talking about. So this week, I'd like to focus on exactly that subject. I've been in this industry since 2015. And what you'll see now is a collection of those uh, YouTube videos and podcasts that I follow on a regular basis. Uh, You'll see the table at the end of of this video and um, it will be a table with the name of of the podcast or YouTube video and then in the case of YouTube I also added the subscribers so that you can find it uh, easier in case there is somebody pretending to be that YouTuber. So let's start with it. Crypto 101. It's a podcast. It's two uh, guys that are doing interviews and uh, about uh, one every two or three days. Um, they're fantastic, those interviews, because they're neutral. Yeah, they don't pretend to be uh, threatening or anything like that. They're just neutral. They're really ki- uh, uh, kind and they get the information that you as a user would like to hear. So Crypto 101, fantastic podcast. Next one is Ivan on Tech. Uh, So that's for us here at Category 5, an interesting one because he focuses on the coding and programming side. He does seven days a week uh, a YouTube video. So he's one of the leaders in this industry in regards to programming and uh, coding. Uh, The third one is Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, He is one of the OGs in the crypto industry. Um, 2014, he did a presentation in front of the... Canadian uh, Senate. Uh, He does probably five or six YouTube videos a week. And the nice thing for you is that he categorizes them. So it's not just talking about everything. He categorizes them uh, so that it's easy for you to find uh, or see if it's something that's of interest to you or not. Next one is crypto, whereby the O is a zero. It's not an O, it's a zero. Uh, it's a guy called Omar Bam, really nice guy, has been in this industry for an age, long time, 
knows everybody and has got fairly good news. He does it also around every two or three days. Uh, <clears throat> Follow is uh, Crypto Bud, um, who I rate very high because he is coming from the trading, traditional trading or traditional finance point of view. And he does a fantastic analysis on coins and tokens and projects. He really goes into detail with those and analyzes them. And, um, and it's very good what he does. Followed is Laura Shin. I would say she's the only real journalist in this industry. And when she has got somebody that she interviews, those interviews go in depth and, um, and are really professional. So I love to listen to Laura Shin's podcasts. Crypto Daily <clears throat> is the next one. He is the fun guy of this industry. If you're interested in memes um, uh, combined with some information, then he's the right guy for you. <clears throat> If you want to enlighten your life a little bit, then yes, definitely go with uh, Crypto Daily. The modern investor is somebody that never shows his face. Uh, he sits somewhere in Europe and he reads the news as he finds them on all those news outlet, outlet, outlets that exist. Uh, he does it very well. Um, he uh, also uh, gives his own opinion on those. Um, yeah, the modern investor. Next one is Stefan Livera. Um, if that's somebody, if you want to geek out, that's the right person for you. Um, behind Andreas Antonopoulos, he, I would say he is the one who has got the most detailed knowledge on products, wallets, exchanges, everything. Um, uh, he does interviews and he has always also the top people uh, lined up. So Stefan Livera for the technical people. Box mining, next one, is also um, uh, technical. He was a programmer, a game programmer. He's based in Hong Kong and um, does also very good analysis of tokens and coins. The moment he mixes a lot of news from Hong Kong and, and China, in regards to the virus that is currently going around. and um, But when he goes to crypto, his knowledge is very good and also unbiased. Last but not least is Data Dash. I would say he's the best one doing technical analy analysis. So if you're into technical analysis, then Data Dash is the right person. Uh, he uh, has got very good knowledge, huge follow base, and, um, and knows, and knows the market also very well. So all those here that I just mentioned are those that I'm watching on a regular basis. Uh, I rate all those as neutral people that really know what they're talking about. So that's the ones that I recommend to you. And as you'll see in a second, uh, you'll have that table behind me uh, so you don't have to write things down. Anyway, I wish you a great week. Um, all the best. Um, see you next week. Um, and yeah, stay safe. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder for you viewing at home, we are not giving financial advice here on the show. However, we're just giving you the facts and letting you run with it. Keep in mind, though, that the cryptocurrency um, market is always changing, always evolving, and is always volatile. So we suggest only invest what you can afford to lose. Now with more of your tech news, here's Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Best known for its electric cars, Elon Musk's company Tesla also makes batteries that store renewable energy on both domestic and industrial scales, and they have applied to become an electricity supplier in the UK. The application was lodged at the end of March with the UK's Gas and Electricity Markets Authority for a license to generate electricity to supply any premises in Great Britain. There has been lower demand for electricity during lockdown as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, with many factories and major businesses um, having to shut down. But electricity supply and demand has to be balanced within the grid for it to function. Being able to generate and store our own electricity does have its appeal, especially if the grid becomes unbalanced and requires the power to be cut temporarily. In addition, Tesla has developed software called AutoBidder that allows customers to sell surplus electricity back to the grid automatically. 
They use Auto Bidder in South Australia, but it's not yet clear if they plan to build similar large battery plants in the UK, which are required to store the surplus. The home version of the Tesla battery, the Powerwall, costs thousands of British pounds and requires a set of solar panels. You may remember the Pocophone F1. Now the Poco F2 Pro has launched complete with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 and impressive 8K video recording. The Pocophone F1 was a rare beast and an, an actual example of a flagship killer. Now, almost two years later, it's finally time for an upgrade. The Poco brand began as a sub-brand of Chinese phone manufacturer, Xiaomi. But with the success of the F1, it was decided that it could stand on its own, and they broke it out into its own independent company based in India. Following the F1, they rebranded the mid-range Redmi K30, calling it the Poco X2. Now the new F2 model is essentially a rebranded K30 Pro. The Poco F2 Pro brings a long list of improvements compared to the F1, starting with the latest chipset. The Snapdragon 865 is the best chip from Qualcomm yet, and one of the first to feature GPU drivers that can be updated, which might improve the phone's longevity. A lot of emphasis was placed on the liquid-cooled 2.0 tech, with a vapor chamber that in itself is larger than competing phones. Poco says this will enable more efficient cooling. The F2 Pro runs Android 10 out of the box with Poco Launcher 2.0. Dark mode is available, which looks gorgeous on the upgraded AMOLED screen. Storage now starts at 128 gigabytes. There's also a 256 gigabytes option, which we'd recommend since they've removed the microSD slot, and the 8K video can eat up a lot of space. The storage is fast, UF, UFS 3.1, up from 2.1 on the F1. The new camera on the, on the Poco F2 Pro may be what pushes die-hard Pocophone F1 fans to upgrade. The phone has four rear-facing camera sensors. The setup includes a 64 megapixel pixel Sony IMX686 sensor. It supports three-time optical, optical zoom as well as dual optical image stabilization. There's also a 13 megapixel ultra-wide angle camera, an 8 pixel mega uh, an 8 megapixel telemac telemac this is a tongue twister, an 8 megapixel telemacro camera, and a 5 megapixel sensor. For selfies, you get a 20 megapixel camera on a motorized pop-up mechanism capable of just a 1080p video. That's the one thing we'd really like to see improve for vloggers who are forced to use the rear cameras if they want to shoot in 4K or 8K Ultra HD. Speaking of Ultra HD, the more powerful chipset enables 8K recording at the full 30 FPS and 4K videos can now be recorded at 60 FPS. The switch to AMOLED also let, uh, allowed the fingerprints reader to be hidden in the screen. The screen refreshes at a standard 60 Hz but the touch sampling rate has been increased to 180 Hz. The POCO F2 also has Widevine L1 certification, so it can play HD content from Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and other services. The capacity of the battery has increased to a 4700 mAh with faster 30 watt charging, and a headphone jack is still included. The POCO F2 is available now through our partners. Head over to cat5.tv slash f2 to check it out. According to a spokesperson for the company Twitter, CEO Jack Dorsey told uh, employees on Tuesday that many of them will be allowed to work from home in perpetuity, even after the coronavirus pandemic ends. In an email first obtained by BuzzFeed News, Dorsey said it was unlikely that Twitter would open its offices before September and that all in-person events would be cancelled for the remainder of the year. The company will assess its plans for 2021 events later this year. The spokesperson said, We were uniquely positioned to respond quickly and allow folks to work from home given our emphasis on decentralization and supporting a distributed workforce capable of working from anywhere. The past few months have proven we can make that work. So if our employees are in a role and situation that enables them to work from home and they want to continue to do so forever, we will make that happen. If not, our offices will be their warm and welcoming selves with some additional precautions when we feel it's safe to return. 
Twitter's new policy comes as businesses around the world are struggling to adapt to social distancing guidelines and rethinking how they will operate in a post-pandemic world. Major tech companies such as Facebook, Google, and Microsoft were early to move to a work-from-home model and have also been the most cautious in planning for moving employees back into the office. Google has told employees that the vast majority of them will work from home until 2021, though some will return in the early summer. Facebook will similarly start to reopen offices after the July 4 weekend, but will let employees who are able to work from home do so until next year. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Thank you.